Uh, right, so uh, I'm a product manager at Stacklock. Um, we do software supply chain security. In a nutshell, I'm trying to help developers make better choices about the dependencies that they use in their, their software products. Are these projects, these dependencies being maintained? Are they following good security practices? Um, but I'm here to talk about Libya 2. Well, Stacklock will make a brief mention uh, midway through. But um, what is, what is libgit2? Well, it's not libgit.a that Emily was talking about, it's libgit2. Uh, it's a re-implementation of some or much or maybe even most of git in a C library so that you can call regular C functions with typed arguments and get data back. You don't have to try to figure out how to format arguments to git, how to invoke that process, and then how to parse its output. I don't really like screen scraping things. Maybe you don't either. If so, maybe libgit2 is for you. The other nice thing is that it doesn't require git to be installed. So if you are building an application that isn't for developers, you know, most developers have git installed, but uh, if you're building an application that is, I don't know, a hypothetical tool to record your scuba dive logs, and you want to store your data in git format, perhaps because you invented git, then libgit2 might be for you. All of your people who use your scuba diving log app uh, don't have to have git installed, but you can deal with your format in git. And we also have pluggable APIs for things like your configuration storage, your reference storage, and your object database storage. Um, and Emily, I can assure you that that's not a good startup idea because there's just no money there. Um, the, the, the nice thing about libgit2 is that it's got a nice C API, which is unfortunate in 2024 because nobody writes C. Everybody writes Rust or Ruby or .NET. But all of those languages can uh, do FFI, foreign function interface, calling into Git. Because, you know, if, you're, if you are .NET itself, you need to be able to uh, uh, call into, you, you need to be able to perform syscalls. And so that's C on Unix and it's C on Windows. So .NET needs to be able to call C, Ruby needs to be able to call C. Every language has the ability to call C somehow. Um, and so by being the least common denominator, by libgit2 being written in C, we make that relatively straightforward. I'm working on making that a little more straightforward, more on that in a minute. Um, but like that's sort of the one of libgit2's superpowers, if you will. So there's libgit2 sharp if you want to write .NET. There's Ruby uh, rugged if you want to write Ruby, etc. So how did we get here? How did libgit2 come about? Well, actually, I wasn't there for that. I am the maintainer. I've been a contributor for a number of years, but I wasn't around when libgit2 started, so I can only hypothesize a little bit. It was started by a guy named Sean Pierce. Sean came from Google, and I th think that sort of he had two ambitions with libgit2. One was he wanted to be able to build tooling on top of, well, he wanted to be able to build Git tooling within the Google ecosystem and infrastructure. And I've not written code at Google, but I think that you can't just like go exec git and screen scrape the output. I suspect that you need to be able to, you know, build an app that is either C or perhaps Java and distribute it around. Um, the other thing is I have a hunch that he has some architectural sensibilities, much like the things that Emily was describing. Um, about having a core library and a CLI on top of that and maybe some other applications like a code review tool could call into this library as well. And unfortunately, the reason I can only guess at this is because Sean actually passed away in 2018 from lung cancer. Everybody in this room has felt the effects of the work that Sean did. He was prolific. He, he worked on Git. He started the libgit2 project as I showed. When he decided to move on from that, he started the JGit project and then started eGit, which is the Eclipse uh, IDE plugin that calls into JGit. And then he started the Garrett code review tool. When he was actually asked, what's your most important contribution to Git? Um, he said, well, actually there's three. And this isn't like some you know crazy big ego. This is showing the importance that he had on the Git ecosystem. He said, Git fast import first, which is true. Like, how many people came 
to Git, were able to bring their existing repositories to Git because of fast import. It's what you use if you have a Perforce repository. It's what you use if you have a um, SVN repository, a CVS repository. You'll use fast import to get that data out. Uh, he built Git GUI, the first Git GUI, as the name suggests. Uh, and his third most important one project was another, a sublist. It was all of the offshoots that he started, libgit2, jgit, egit, garrett code review. Absolutely prolific. All of us here owe a debt of gratitude to Sean. But Sean did leave the libgit2 project. He went to go work on jgit. Uh, again, I don't know, but I suspect it's probably a lot easier to sling Java around at Google than it is uh, a C library. Um, Vicent Marti uh, came onto the scene. He was a Google Summer of Code student in 2010, sponsored by GitHub. And prior to, to Vicent coming in, GitHub used a little bit of Git and a little bit of their own Ruby Git library that had an unfortunate habit of like corrupting your Git repository. So the goal of libgit2 was to not do that anymore. libgit2 tried to be bug for bug compatible with Git uh, and have language bindings so that they could call into that uh, from, from Ruby. I grabbed this picture because uh, this is him speaking at Git Merge 20, I think 2013 here in Berlin, which has the most unfortunate logo I've ever seen. I have a t-shirt with this on it and I like, I just feel weird wearing it. Scott, if that was on you, I don't know. Anyway, um, this was sort of the highlight of, of libgit2 for me. So Vicent has some really thoughtful API design and, and real taste when it comes to API design. And then he was backed up by a number of other people increasingly at GitHub. Russell Belfer, Carlos uh, Martin Nieto came in as another Google Summer of Code student uh, in 2011. It was like, to me, the, the peak almost of, um, of libgit2. Also corresponds with when I started and started dragging it down. Uh, I was working at Microsoft at the time. So I came into Microsoft in 2009 through an acquisition. Uh, I worked at this tiny little version control company that did cross-platform version control, talking to Windows server stuff. There were three engineers when we got acquired. We were part of a slightly bigger but still tiny version control company called SourceGear. And uh, when I came into Microsoft, you know, coming from a three engineer company to a 30,000 or whatever, engineer company was like, it sort of melted my mind. Um, and I honestly didn't enjoy it. Um, I spent my first year sort of suffering through Microsoft politics and not having much fun. And I was about to leave when my buddy Martin, who also came in through the same startup, you know, pulled me aside and he's like, listen, I'm not having that much fun. I think that what we actually need to do here is start building some distributed version control systems into our products. And we played around with some DVCSs. Uh, the company that we came from, SourceGear, had one called Veracity, which was actually really cool architecturally and technically and had zero users because Git won. Um, anyway, Martin at the time hypothesized that Git was in fact going to win and GitHub was going to win. And if Microsoft ignored that, that we would do so at our own peril. So we needed to, to put Git into Visual Studio, we needed to put Git into Microsoft, what was then called Team Foundation Server. Um, and we did, you can actually, if, if you've been at other Git merges, you may have heard of this, if not, you can find it on, uh, on YouTube, Git Merge 2015, I talked about how we did that. Martin wrangled all the politics of that, I worked on the technical bits. And I noticed like two things really, really quickly. The first was that Git didn't work on Windows very well. In 2024, if you want Git for Windows, you go to gitforwindows.org, you download it, you double click, and it's there. It's so easy that people actually download Git for Windows and install Git for Windows to run a Unix-like subsystem. It's the easiest way to run Bash on Windows is to download Git for Windows. That wasn't the case in, uh, you know, in 2010. You had to figure out, do I want Sigwin? Do I want MSYS? And if we were gonna put Git into Visual Studio, the answer to those questions is neither. We're not doing that. Um, we wanted to use libgit2. So I came into the libgit2 project to sort of beef up the Windows support, which was a little ridiculous given that um, I was, you know, the 
cross-platform version control guy and to round out its feature set so that we could ship uh, Git tooling in Visual Studio. That was a ton of fun for me. I, I, that was, again, my favorite time of libgit2. After that, Vicent left. Um, Carlos stuck around for a little while. We had some new contributors like Patrick Steinhardt, who you'll hear from later. Um, really wonderful time. That's sort of like the history of libgit2, which brings us to the present. Uh, things are not as, honestly, exciting and dynamic and moving forward quite as quickly as I would love them to be. Um, I don't sort of, as a habit, I don't like thinking about the present just in all aspects of life, not just live, get to. Sort of, so I wanna think about, just for a second, the present in terms of where we're going immediately. So what's sort of the work in progress presently in libgit2. So I've got like three kind of branches on my local machine that I push forward a little bit. One is an improved doc site. I, it's a little bit self-explanatory. Our docs need to be better. The, the next one is more CLI goodness, and that's a little less obvious, so I'll talk about that. And the third is just perf improvements. libgit2 in certain areas is not as fast as git. It needs to be. You know, it's relatively simple engineering work. Like, it's not huge refactoring efforts. It's just like sit down and, and, and tease apart some perf gains, measure it, improve it, repeat until you're fast. So that's, that's relatively straightforward. I won't, I won't talk too much about that. I, I had hoped to, to get the new doc site up um, today, but I actually ran into a bit of a bug like last minute on the airplane. Um, but the, the TLDR is I, as the libgit2 maintainer, never read our docs which is a pretty serious problem, right, in terms of dog fooding. I don't read our docs because I don't think they're very good, and then that's a sort of a self, uh, you know, a, a, a cycle that, that continues, which is unfortunate. So I made it a habit to stop going and looking at the implementation when I had a question about an API, but actually look in our docs. And so that led me to do two things. One, some UX improvements on the site itself, uh, and two, to round out the actual documentation, like improve the places where we were a little bit sloppy, where we were a little bit out of date, uh, places where we added a parameter to a struct, or added a member to a struct and then didn't document it, like oopsie. Um, so just cleaning up some documentation, technical debt, but also adding some, a little bit of semantic love on top of that, like is this an out param, uh, what, if this is an unsigned int, does it correspond to an enum that is you know, treated as a bit field? And taking that semantic information now, we can improve the language bindings. So you, know, you can just throw clang at a header file and it'll produce an AST. It'll also like suck in the doxygen, which is the, the you know, documentation format that we use, as pretty much everybody does. And then um, it, you can take that and if, with a little of that semantic sugar that we sprinkled on top, we can output better language bindings so that libgit 2 sharp for instance, doesn't have to reinvent the wheel every time we change our ABI. Because an FFI can work two different ways. Um, like you can do the JNI style or the Rust style, sorry, not Rust, the JNI style or the Ruby style, where to interact with a C function, you write C code and you, that, that C code gets like a Ruby int or in a Ruby string and you've got to marshal that data in and out. Or you can do all your FFI in the language itself. So in .NET, you, you call a C function using pinvoke and if you want to pass a struct, you have to model that struct in C sharp as well. And it has to match up exactly, right? Otherwise you'll have alignment problems if you're passing data in and the C library is trying to dereference that and it's you know, misaligned, you're gonna have a bad day. So we can actually help create those structs automatically, create those language bindings automatically with this semantic information. So I think that that's gonna be a, a really cool sort of feature for the, the language binding authors. The other thing that we're working on is improving the CLI experience that exists on top of libgit2. If you build libgit2, you can build a CLI called git2 that takes arguments in the way that git does and emits output in the way that Git does. And if you've ever heard me talk about 
my thoughts on the quality of the user experience in Git, you might wonder how to square this circle. Like, do we need another thing that acts like Git in the world? The answer is probably no, except that it's very useful if you are writing libgit2 to be able to take the unit tests that already exist that call git and run them against your own, your own code base. I want to be, like I said, bug for bug compatible with git. The way to do that is to use its test suite, and its test suite calls git. So we can swap that out. The other useful thing is to be able to benchmark git against libgit2. Like I said, we, I want to make perf improvements. I can't do that if I'm not measuring them. And Git gives me a handy baseline to measure against. So uh, I call this, is libgit2 fast yet? Uh, it's at benchmarks.libgit2.org. The idea is we just have a test harness that will execute two versions of the Git CLI, whether that's uh, Git and another version of Git, or Git and our libgit2 CLI, and it will be able to you know, do the measurements and time them. It can do some other stuff like uh, you know, blow away your disk cache so you can, you can test um, you know, cold reads versus, versus not, stuff like that. I'm really excited about this. This is like one of the things that's really helping push on improving the perf for like index pack and blame and things like that. The, the sort of problem though with the present state of libgit2 is its contributions. Um, thinking about contributors, this is a chart of, of number of contributions. I think it's number of commits. I forget exactly what this counts. But, you know, if you, it, it's blobby, but if you put a best fit line over it, it's actually not that bad. We're still seeing contributions. The problem with those contributions is that they're largely one person, and that one person is me. Um, which is a bummer, both for, you know, you and for me. Um, and uh, especially since I have a, a three-year-old daughter now, and honestly, hacking on libgit2 on my weekends is not nearly as much fun as it is hanging out with her. I, I did a little exercise. I said stack lock would come back up uh, in the talk, and it does. Um, the, this is our product, Trusty, uh, which takes a look at dependencies. So it'll, it'll look at the NPM ecosystem, Maven, Cargo, those sorts of things and sort of try to assess the health, both in terms of security and in terms of maintainability, to give you an answer like, is this a good project that you should depend on? And I sort of you know, made it go into a Git repository, which it's not quite supposed to do, but these are the things you can do when you're a product manager at the company. Uh, and I gave us a, a, trusty rather, gives us a C, 78, if you want to think about it in terms of percentages, uh, which is not bad, but that's, that's primarily due to the fact that we don't have a diverse maintainer set, we don't have a diverse contributor set. And I think that that is, to me, the most important thing that we can do and change in libgit2. And there is actually a lot of opportunity there because it turns out that we actually have a lot of money, which is a little bit shocking. Not like a lot of money like I can go embezzle it and run off and go to a country with low extradition policies, but enough that libgit2 itself can, can spend it in a way that is, is useful. Uh, this money came from Radical, who uh, uses a bit of libgit2, you know, they also use a bit of git oxide, and they make it a habit to contribute back to their dependencies. So they've made a pretty generous contribution to libgit2, uh, Git Kraken, the Git client, also made a, a recent donation, and um, that's all managed thanks to our sponsor, our fiscal sponsor, Open Collective. Big fan of Open Collective. Uh, how are we going to spend that money then? Well, two ways. First, um, and I also didn't get this done before the conference, but my friends at Open Collective assure me that they're working on it. Um, we're going to contribute part of that money back. So for for new contributions that come to libgit2, we will make two donations. Um, one is to git2rs, which are the Rust bindings to libgit2, and the other is to git oxide. I really believe that having a linkable git library is useful and important, but I also kind of want to hedge my bets, right? Like, it's very possible that Rust is the future uh, of, 
of software development. It's memory safe. That sounds great. How many times have, have you dealt with a, a production bug because you overflowed a, a buffer? I, maybe you haven't, but I have done it numerous times because I write C on a server, or I used to, rather. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's really important. The other thing that, though, we can do is we can use some of this money to um, to encourage contribution in the libget2 space. And I don't know exactly what this looks like. Is it a bounty? Uh, do we sponsor uh, a programmer? Do we hire somebody literally? Uh, I, I, I don't know quite what shape this will take, but um, I think that it's crucial to um, improve the, the number of contributors and the number of maintainership uh, in the libget2 project if it's going to uh, continue to be a, a viable dependency for, for you. So that's something that you're interested in. Talk to me. Let's brainstorm. Um, you know, more news on that in the future. Uh, my goal is to get that trusty score back up into the 90s. So really excited about that. Um, as well as, you know, future directions that Git takes. You know, we have SHA-256 support in libgit2. It's behind a feature flag. Um, the ref table support that you'll hear about uh, later uh, is in a pull request, but you know, these things need to uh, continue to mature and grow. So I'm really excited about the future of libgit2 as much as perhaps even more than I am about uh, the past. So thanks so much. Uh, I'll be around if you have any questions. Uh, if you don't want to grab me in person, you can find me on the social medias. I'm E. Thompson, Thompson without a P. So thanks so much. Great to be here. Enjoy lunch.